And it reminded me a lot of life. You know, we make our plans. We have our expectations that we build our life around. And then we put all of this pressure on ourselves to get it all right and to hold it all together. And it's exhausting. Have any of you ever just been exhausted from trying to hold everything in your life together and just get it all right? Can you raise your hands if you've had moments like that before? I've got another question for you. How many of you are in a season right now where you feel overwhelmed with life? Yeah, we've all been there. We've all had those seasons. There are moments and seasons, and some of us are in one right now, where you feel overwhelmed and overburdened with life and all of the expectations and responsibilities that come along with it. But the good news, and what we're going to talk about today, is that God invites us to rest in him. So we're going to look at what Matthew chapter 11 says about rest today. And um, before we jump into that, I want to give you a little, little recap about where we are in Scripture here. At this point in chapter 11 in Jesus' life and ministry, him and his disciples have been traveling all over the area of Galilee. They've been preaching and teaching. Jesus has been performing miracles. He's been healing people. He has been just displaying his power all over Galilee. And here in chapter 11, he mentions three cities. He calls out Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And in these three cities, the people have seen Jesus display his power. They had seen him heal the blind man. They'd seen him feed the 5,000. I mean, they literally had a front row seat to the power of Jesus. And can you imagine that? We get to read about it in scripture, but they got to experience it, which is just amazing. And so Jesus is talking about these three cities, and he basically says, you've seen all of this, but still you have unbelief in your heart. Still, you don't believe that I am who I say that I am. So a few things that we know about these three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, they were three of the largest cities in Galilee. They had established synagogues or places of worship. They had a huge workforce. There was plenty of jobs. They had a large trade industry, and they were known as being wise and intelligent. And so if you're like me, you're thinking, wow, they got it going on, right? These three cities, they have it all together. They are um, doing big things. They're thriving, and they're growing, and they're intelligent, which is all amazing things. But the problem is that they relied on themselves to work out their life and to work out their sin. They believed in their religious systems, in lists of do's and don'ts, and checklists, and living by expectations to be able to earn their way to God and earn righteousness. But the truth is, they were overburdened. And in this case, they were overburdened with those systems and expectations that had been placed on them by the religious leaders. So we're going to see what Jesus says when he speaks to this crowd here in chapter 11. And I want to invite you, if you will, to stand with me as I read this. We want to stand to honor God and to honor this word this morning. And we're going to jump in here as Jesus addresses this crowd and the religious leaders there. He gives one of the most powerful invitations and one of the most beautiful promises in Scripture here in chapter 11, verse 28. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, because I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we have your word as a guide for us in life, Father. We thank you that it is living and breathing, and God, we believe that right now, in this moment, that you are using it to speak to our hearts. God, help us to open our hearts and our minds to hear your voice, to know your voice, and God, to respond to what you're calling us to do today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, all the parents, I want to hear you say a big amen, right? Amen. Woo, parenthood is exhausting. If you've ever brought a newborn home from the hospital, you know true exhaustion. I, I really seriously do not remember the first three months of my kids' lives. Like, <laughs> I was thinking, like, I'm thankful we took photos so I can look back and see how cute they were because I really don't remember it. But um, parenthood is exhausting. You are sleep deprived. You are, someone's constantly needing something from you. Your world just flips upside down. And it's a season where you need rest. 
And I just want to go ahead and put your mind, hearts and minds at ease and say, it's okay to rest. Some of us need to hear that. It's okay to rest. You don't have to feel guilty about resting. Um, so I'm a mom, obviously. I just said that. I said I'm a parent. But I've learned a few things over my years in um, taking care of my kids. So I'm not a pro at parenting, but there's a little secret that I want to share with you that has just changed my life. So you can call it a tip, trick, hack, secret, whatever you want to call it. I want to share it with you because it has been life-changing. So here it is. Are you ready? Write it down. Hit record on your phone. We're going to, go, we're going to do this thing. So at a very young age, teach your kid how to make a bowl of cereal. <laughs> I'm being dead serious. <laughs> if you're from the South, teach your kid how to fix a bowl of cereal, right? That's what we say. <laughs> um, as early as five years old, Ella was fixing her own bowl of cereal on a Saturday morning. And let me tell you, it changed my life. It was amazing. She got to eat when she was hungry, and I got a few extra minutes of sleep and didn't have to get up at the crack of dawn. So to me, it was a win-win. And um, Ella's so amazing that now not only does she fix her own cereal, but she makes her brother's breakfast also. So she is just awesome. I'm so thankful for her. But it's the gift that keeps on giving. As you have more kids, you continue to get rest. So that's a little secret for you. But sometimes we need rest, and that's okay. There are seasons that are just more physically tiring than others, and that we need more physical rest. But Jesus is calling out, and he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So who is Jesus talking to here? He says, All, everyone, who labor and are heavy laden. So when you think of labor, what do you think about when you hear the word labor? Maybe you think of work, physical work. Sometimes we think of our job. Right? We celebrate Labor Day. We think of our job. Some of us think of childbirth. Right? It's called labor for a reason. We don't have to go into any details there. We will leave it at that. Some of us think of that. Um, but labor simply means hard work or striving. And here in this passage, Jesus is talking to everyone who is exhausted from striving. And they're exhausted from trying to work out their life on their own and to make things right with God by earning their way to God. And Jesus counters that by saying, come and I will give you rest. Now that is so counter to what culture and society teaches us, right? We're taught that we need to work for everything that we have or that we need to earn everything that we have. And scripture values work, God values work. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus totally flips that upside down. And he says, when it comes to me, you don't have to earn my love. You don't have to earn your way to God. I will give you rest. Rest is a gift and a promise. It's a gift in that you don't have to work for it or earn it, and it's a promise of God. You know that God keeps his promises. You can look at his track record in Scripture and all throughout your life, and you know that God will be faithful to keep his promise, and he will do it. He says, all who labor, and then he says, all who are heavy laden. What laden basically means is loaded down or weighed down. Another word for that is burdened. Has anybody ever been burdened in here? Yes, we've all had, had times where we felt burdened. Some, sometimes the circumstances of life are hard and heavy. And it's hard to carry that weight. You walk through things that you never thought you'd be walking through in life. But do you want to hear something really good? Jesus doesn't say, everyone who has their life together and got it all right this week, come to me. Isn't that good? The good news in that is messy is okay when coming to Jesus. You don't have to clean up your mess. You don't have to collect yourself. You don't have to make sure that you don't make a mistake before you come to him. He simply says, come to me, bring all of your burdens, bring the weight of sin and all of the hard stuff that you've been walking through, and I will give you rest. Verse 29 says, take my yoke. What does take my yoke mean? You ever heard this and thought about that? What does take my yoke mean? My dad was a pastor. I know Pastor Andy mentioned that on the video. He was a pastor, and I had the wonderful opportunity of being able to hear him preach every week, and I just I miss it so much. He, that was his passion was preaching, and I loved hearing him every week and hearing him teach. But I remember him teaching this scripture. He's at the front on stage at the pulpit. I'm sitting in the back coloring and half listening and half not listening. 
But I, when I hear this, take, Jesus says, take my yoke, my antenna went up, and I'm like, okay, hold on. Jesus is talking about yolks. Are we talking about egg yolks here? Like, <laughs> are we saying be like an egg yolk? Do we actually put an egg yolk on our head? I'm trying to make this make sense to me. Um, thankfully, I figured it out as I got a little older. <laughs> but um, what Jesus isn't talking about egg yolks here. If you've ever had that thought, if not, maybe it's just me as a kid. Welcome to my brain as a child. But um, a yoke was a really well-known term back in the day. And basically, it was a tool used by farmers. It was a wooden bar or harness that they would place on their animal. And it would help make carrying a heavy load easier and lighter. And it was also, it would help the farmers be able to guide the animal in the direction that they need to go. So without the yoke, the animal would be running all over the field, getting into trouble, getting hurt, and into situations they didn't need to be in. So Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. And what does he mean by this? We're talking about being overburdened and that he's going to give us rest. But then he tells us here to put something else on. When Jesus says, take my yoke, what he means is, get connected with me, submit to my will, and let me lead. 